My name is Katherine Smith and I'm the author of The Gatekeeper, Missy Lahan, FDR, and the untold story of the partnership that defined a presidency. Marguerite Lahand, who was known to everyone as Missy, was the private secretary of Franklin Delano Roosevelt for more than 20 years. Today, when we hear the name on the job title secretary, we think, oh, that's kind of a, a low-level job. But in FDR's White House, that was the ultimate job, was to be the secretary of the president. He actually had four. And as a group, they were called the White House Secretariat. Besides Missy, there was Louis Howe, who was his um, political advisor. There was a press secretary named Steve Early. And then there was an appointment secretary named Marvin McIntyre that everyone known as, knew as Mac. And then there was Missy, the private secretary. And between, among the four of them, they ran the White House. Um, they all appeared together on the cover of Time Magazine in 1934 as the White House Secretary. And this was at a time when very few women were ever on the cover of Time. Missy had a, a variety of job duties. She um, also lived in the White House. And so she was at, at FDR's beck and call almost 24 7. Um, after um, Louis Howe died in 1936, Missy took over most of his duties as far as running the secretarial pool, handling all the mail, being over the switchboard and that sort of thing, and became the de facto White House Chief of Staff. Now that was a job title that had never been used um, and was not used until the 50s when Eisenhower became president, but that's really what she was. I want to read a little section from the book that describes how the Secretariat worked. Louis's genius in political strategy, Steve's inspired press management, and Mac's genial handling of appointments all served Roosevelt well. But Missy was the Swiss army knife of the White House. A formidable, multi-talented, multitasker, Missy might on any given day be directing the work of 50 staffers, writing a check to Franklin Jr.'s doctor for treatment of hemorrhoids, telling the president the wording in a speech just doesn't sound like you, soothing an irate bureaucrat who couldn't get an appointment, and then racing over to the White House to pour tea for a crowd of archaeologists. In a letter she dashed off to her niece, Missy lamented, I am having a devilish time trying to finish this. The telephone, callers, and that man, the P. How did Missy serve as FDR's gatekeeper? Um, Missy was the only staff member who had an office adjoining the president's. She had a little office right outside the Oval Office, so she knew everyone who came in, who the phone calls were coming from. Um, she handled FDR's mail. She really had knew everything that was going on in the White House. And not only that, but since she lived in the White House, she spent most of her evenings with FDR. She would go to every White House official function, and if there wasn't anything going on, she would just sit with him in his study upstairs and listen to music or help him with his stamp collection. And at those times, FDR just liked to think out loud. So they were talking about these big decisions of government, and she was weighing in with her thoughts. And she became a really influential White House advisor. Missy also operated the backdoor access to the Oval Office. So if someone wanted to see FDR, and FDR wanted to see them, but didn't want them to appear on his official calendar, he'd just say, call Miss Lahan and she'll slip you in the back door through her office. Now, Missy also used this to get people in who she wanted to meet FDR and be with FDR. And one of these people was a man named Tommy Corcoran. He was an Irish-American Catholic like Missy, and he was a lawyer who worked for the federal government. He was very able. He was also a really fun guy to have around, so Missy invited him to come over one night after dinner and play his accordion and sing to FDR, and FDR loved that kind of musical entertainment because he had a nice singing voice himself. Well, Tommy Corcoran started showing up at Missy's office most mornings, and he would tell her what he was hearing on the street and what the gossip was, and she'd go in and tell FDR, hey, Tommy's out here, and he says, blah, 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 blah. And FDR would say, oh, send Tommy in, I want to talk to him. And in that way, Tommy wormed his way into the inner circle of the White House also. He became one of FDR's speechwriters. 
um, a very good drafter of legislation and also the White House lobbyist on Capitol Hill. So a lot of the New Deal legislation got through Congress because um, Tommy Corkin was pushing it and he got there because of his friendship with Missy Lehan. Um, another thing that Missy was over was the White House switchboard. And the rule at the White House is you didn't wake the president up um, after he went to bed without consulting with Missy. So on September 1st, 1939, when a call came in from Europe that Hitler had invaded Poland, it went to Missy's bedside phone and the switchboard said, I've got uh, Ambassador Bullitt on the phone, Hitler's invaded Poland, can we wake up the president? Well, of course she said yes, and that was the beginning of World War II. What did Eleanor Roosevelt think of Missy? Um, Eleanor Roosevelt thought of Missy as a member of the family because she had come to work for the Roosevelts so young. She was in her early 20s and actually Eleanor had handpicked her as a secretary for her husband. And she thought of her in a sort of um, motherly way, even though she wasn't old enough to be Missy's mother. She looked after her when she was sick. Um, when Missy's mother died while they were campaigning for president in 1932, Eleanor dropped everything, went home with her, helped handle the funeral arrangements, um, and comforted Missy in her grief. Um, the good thing about Missy and Eleanor was she enabled Eleanor to become the modern first lady that we think of. Um, Eleanor traveled so much that her secret service name was Rover. It was the name that FDR had selected for her. And when Eleanor traveled um, on business for her husband or else in the, the many causes that she was involved with, um, such as civil rights, she could leave the White House knowing that Missy would back her up as hostess and keep FDR company and that sort of thing. And that was part of Missy's job. She really worked around the clock. Um, the marriage between the Roosevelts was distant. FDR had been unfaithful to Eleanor. Um, some years before, before he um, even knew Missy. And um, he had been unfaithful with Eleanor's social secretary. So one of the things that gets confused in people's mind is they think that Missy is the secretary when it was, it was really someone else. Um, there doesn't seem to have been any jealousy between Eleanor and, and Missy. Um, they just had a really respectful relationship and cared a lot for each other. Why is Missy's story only being told now? Um, Missy had a, a lifetime of heart trouble that began when she had rheumatic fever as a child. It, it permanently damaged her heart. And she died when she was only 47. She had a massive stroke when she was 44, had to leave the White House. Uh, she never married, never had children, never wrote a memoir. And most of the people who worked around FDR wrote memoirs almost as soon as, as his, his life ended in 1945 and, you know, bragged about how important they were. Missy never did that. So um, this, her story has not been carried forward. Usually when people have written about Missy and biographies of FDR and the like, she's marginalized as a love-starved secretary or um, even as a presidential mistress. And I think this has been really unfair to her. It's, um, it is, people have played down her importance as an advisor and confidant and focused on these other areas. One of the things that I discovered during my research was the, um, the huge archive of letters and invitations and pictures and newspaper clippings kept by her family. So I've collaborated with them on this book. I also analyzed the letters that she had written to William Christian Bullitt, who was the man she was in love with most of the time she was in the White House. He was an ambassador, so it was a long distance relationship as he served in Russia and France. But whenever he came back to Washington, they would go out and she was really crazy about this guy. So the idea that she was FDR's in-house mistress at the whole time she was in love with William Christian Bullitt is really hard for me to swallow. Um, if we want to compare Missy to someone in modern times, you'd have to look at Valerie Jarrett and her relationship with President Obama. Valerie Jarrett is the senior advisor in the White House and she's also called the first friend because she's so close to Barack Obama. And when Missy died, um, 
when FDR died and his will was re revealed, he had left um, half of the income of his estate each year to my friend, Marguerite Lahan, and half to Eleanor. And he told his son before he died that it was the least he could do for Missy because she had served him so well for so long and asked for so little in return. It's really such a sad story. Every time I get to the end of the book, I just feel like crying. <laughs> Why did you write The Gatekeeper? Um, I've been reading about FDR for years. I think he's fascinating. And I kept getting glimpses of this woman who was his private secretary. And I thought, what a fascinating life she led. I wonder what she was like. So I finally wanted to read a biography of her and discovered that no one had ever written one. So I said, well, I think I'll write one. And I did.